Cool. How's everybody doing? All right. Welcome out on a rainy day. Second um, safety awareness meeting of the semester here at CCBC. Most of you guys know me. I'm Professor Waters, ably assisted, as always, by Aaron Kersner. And we got two great presenters today. We've got Roger Cox, uh, who's a teaching safety at CCBC, formerly the NTSB. He's going to talk to us about a uh, subject that's very much in the news. And then we're going to uh, do our AOPA video the way we normally do. We'll take a break. And then we'll proceed on with Ian Selby, who's going to talk to us about the rotary wing side of the house. So uh, remember, if you're looking online, make sure that you log into the chat log. Tell me what your name is. I don't need your student number, but I do need your real name. If, you're, uh, if you've logged in as your nickname, that doesn't help me because I'm going to need it for attendance. And uh, if you have a question, just put it in the chat log and we'll take care of that. All right. Are you ready to roll? All right. Hopefully the technology is manageable. Uh, not that one. Not that one. There we go. Okay. So I'm just gonna get the space bar move forward. Oh, yeah, just hit right there. Yeah. So may, may, I hold the may I hold the mic? Should we hear the mic? Yeah. Is this working? Yeah. Raise your hand if you can. Okay, good. Uh, welcome to our safety awareness meeting. It's uh, my first opportunity to address the students here. I'm an adjunct professor of aviation and I teach aviation safety. Some of you know me, uh, having been in my classes. Uh, and uh, I'm here to talk today about the 737 MAX, what's going on. Uh, probably everybody knows that there's been a controversy and a couple of accidents. Uh, and we're all standing by wondering what to think about this. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that. I'm plugged in on this one. I know the people involved in the investigation. And uh, so I'm able to get a little information that maybe the average person doesn't get. Uh, before I get too far down the, the line here, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I was a, an Air Force pilot and an airline pilot uh, for 38 years, about 18,000 uh, hours. In 2006, I hit age 60, uh, and the rule was you can't fly airliners anymore. At that time, that was the rule. Uh, I retired and unfortunately got to work for the NTSB, and I stayed there for about nine and a half years. Uh, and uh, since I live not too far from here and I had the opportunity to teach here, uh, I get to do this, but it's not nearly as uh, demanding and stressful as this one is. Uh, investigated uh, uh, over 100 accidents in my years at the board. Uh, in my primary job was operational factors uh, and working for major aircraft accidents, not small aircraft accidents. Uh, a couple of the notable ones that you may have heard of were Colvin 3407. Uh, and Asiana 214 in San Francisco. And uh, I wrote many of the recommendations in those, which are plaguing some of you today, uh, and which are plaguing airline pilots today, uh, making them maybe do some things they'd rather not do. So that's my background. Uh, today, uh, let's recap a little bit. I'll talk a little bit about the airplane itself, and then we'll talk a little bit about the current investigations that are going on. There's two of them going on right now. Here we have a little picture of the MAX, and the reason I put this up is you can see uh, part of the challenge is those Leap 1 engines uh, that have been installed on this airplane. Uh, they are a different engine than the CFM 56 that's been on the previous models, uh, and they're heavier. Uh, they're, they provide a lot more thrust, uh, and uh, they have to be, uh, because they have a large diameter, uh, they would be too close to the ground if mounted on the old pylons. So they have to be mounted forward and slightly higher than the old engines. And that changes the weight and balance and the flight dynamics of the airplane. So you can take a look at that and you can see how high that pylon really is and how high that engine is mounted. That is important. So let's go back originally and say, how long have we had 737s? We've got at least 10 models of this airplane starting with the 737-100 that came out in 1967. Uh, I flew this airplane a little bit in the 80s. My airline had one of the old 100s, and it was, I think, an antique even at that time. Need to put the mic Okay. Uh, it was an antique even at that time. Uh, 
Uh, we called ours a U-boat because United had originally bought the airplane. Uh, and uh, since that time, there have been many, many subsequent models, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, and now the maxes. So maybe 10 versions, not counting the Boeing business jet or the military versions of the airplane. So how have they gone about this? They've gone about it through stretching. Uh, there's a quick overview, you can't really tell, but you can probably see the dimensions, how the wingspan has increased, how the length of the airplane has changed, uh, and all those different versions. And you might ask yourself, since 1967, haven't there been enough advancements in aircraft design that they really need to build a new airplane? And we have to ask the question, why have they continued to build this airplane? There's the 800. It's the most recent popular version today. You'll see a lot of them out at the airport. Uh, they're popular all around the world. And the MAX is an upgraded version of the 800 and also the 900. This is what we call the MAX family. Uh, there is a 7X, an 8X, and a 9X. The 10X is still on the drawing boards. Uh, and each of them are a stretch. And each of them are an extension of the original 1967 certificate that was issued by the FAA. Here's an example of the differences of the engines. Up on the left top there, that's an old uh, JT8D engine uh, that was on the original 100s and 200s. I flew them. Uh, they're noisy. Uh, you can see that even then, the engine is close to the ground. Uh, the airplane was designed to be close to the ground. They, this airplane was originally intended to be what we would now call a regional jet, flying back and forth in small airports where they didn't have uh, jetways and uh, they didn't want to have complicated uh, belt loaders. You needed to be able to have a, a ramp serviceman be able to go and walk right in and reach into the cargo compartment. Uh, in fact, you could even put air stairs into the airplane if you wanted to, so you could land at a place that was bare bones and serve it. That was the original idea of the airplane. That's why it's low to the ground. Uh, the middle engine, that's the CM56 that is on the, on the uh, what they call the classic jets. Uh, pretty good engine, pretty good big diameter. And then, of course, there's the leak. Take a look, look at the difference between the pylon there and the pylon here. I hope you can tell the leap is mounted in a much higher position. And think about what that does for the weight and balance of the airplane. Cockpits. Up in the upper left hand corner, this is what we call the Jurassic Jet. Round dial, seam gauges. Uh, fun to fly. Uh, autopilot, very basic. Uh, no FMS. Uh, basically, you did most of the calculations yourself. Most of our performance data was in little books or booklets or charts that we carry around with us. And uh, nobody knew what an iPad was or anything else like that. You had to do it yourself. Uh, the middle is the middle versions of 300, 400. You can see, I think, although this is kind of small picture, uh, that we've now started to put EPIS, electronic flight instruments, there on the captain to co pilot side. Uh, and some of the instruments in the middle, electronic. But we still have a basic flight control set up with the yoke and the center cable and all the normal stuff. And the, and the overhead panel is pretty much the same. Now we get down here to the 800, and you can see they even put even more EPA screens into the airplane. Uh, but the still, the console is pretty similar. The throttles, thrust levers, uh, flap controls, spoiler controls, are the same. And if you look very carefully, you can see the trim wheel in every one of these. The trim wheel is just on the left and right side of the console where the throttles are. That's the manual trim wheel. We'll take a better look at that. So here is a max top kit. They got really big screens here, kind of like you've all got at home now with your gigantic TV screens when you watch The Price is Right. And uh, uh, you, you see two FNCs. 
Uh, you can see a very, very different setup that is the autopilot controller across the top of the auto flight system. Uh, it's in the same location as the, the 300, the 200, 300 on, but it's configured very differently, uh, all electronically at this point in time. So the basic architecture of the airplane is the same, but a lot of changes to the peripherals, to the avionics, uh, to the wingtips, uh, to the length of the airplane. And when you compare with the first airplane we started out with, with the last airplane, they look like different airplanes almost. So we come back to that fundamental question, why? We'll talk about that. All right. You've probably heard a lot about the maneuvering characteristics, augmentation system. Uh, when Lion Air crashed last October in, uh, down in uh, Jakarta, uh, <clears throat> I was in discussions with some people who were close to the investigation, and they were asking me some technical questions about this 737. And uh, there was a big hole in the explanation that I couldn't explain. Uh, I got out the diagrams out of the flight crew operating manual for the 737-800, which I had at home. And I was looking for an input of the angle of attack vane into the flight control computer. And it wasn't there. And I said to the person who was asking me these questions, I don't see it on an 800. He said, now we're getting word that there is this mysterious thing that has been introduced by Boeing, called this MCAS. They put this extra feature on the airplane and they didn't tell anybody. They didn't tell the pilots, they didn't tell the airlines, they didn't put it in the FCOM. You know, the rationale was it's a minor change and you really don't need to know it. Believe me, a lot of pilots get mad when you tell them, you don't need to know this. <laughs> and uh, so right off the bat, we had uh, some bad press for Boeing for doing that. Uh, so to move on now, what is the NCAS? It's really just a addition to what they call a flight control computer in this airplane. Uh, that senses when the airplane is pitched up to a very dangerously extreme pitch attitude. And it provides a small input to the stabilizer to bring that nose down. In and of itself, that's not an, an unusual feature. All of the Airbuses from A320 on have uh, envelope protection that works pretty much just like this. The Airbus, in normal law, will not let you get beyond the pitch attitude of the uh, part of the envelope. Uh, the 777, 787, fly-by-wire airplanes, they also have these uh, limitations and protections built into the airplane to prevent you from getting into extreme attitudes in the end of phase flight. One of the challenges is this is a Jurassic jet that has been modified and modified and modified, and this is an add-on. It's not part of the original design of the airplane. It's designed to be somewhat competitive with other more modern airplanes in terms of its flight control features. But I don't think anybody at Boeing really expected this to actually come into play very well. Because you have to get up to a pretty extreme attitude. You have to be at low weight and high thrust. And they thought this would never happen. Well, rarely happen. They had to put this on because when they moved those engines, they, they added the weight and they added the thrust and they moved them up and forward. It not only changed the weight balance of the airplane somewhere, but it also changed the thrust vector. Well, High amount of thrust is put on to the airplane at low speed. It causes a pitch up, significant pitch up. And that could be uh, dangerous if allowed to go on. Normally, you would expect anybody flying these airplanes 
to sense that, and anticipate it, and prevent it. But these airplanes are produced in the thousands, I think they're produced over 5,000, and they're sold all around the world. And it's pretty hard to know that every single person flying one of these airplanes all around the world has the skill, the training, and the background to anticipate that pitch up and deal with it effectively. And there may be people out there who really can't do that very well. Boeing doesn't really think about that. So that's an MCAS. That's essentially what it does. We didn't find out about it until last October. And therein lies a lot of the controversy today. They put it on, they didn't tell people about it, it came and bit them, and now they are in a defensive posture trying to explain why they did what they did. In addition, uh, the FAA basically gave them a pass. Uh, for many decades, the FAA has been the de facto certification leader in the world of certified nurses. Uh, much of Part 23 and Part 25, which are our regulations about designing airplanes, are adopted around the world. When countries start to build their buses and Embraers and Canadairs, they tend to adopt our rules. And they have accepted our certification standards as the best. Now, there's questions as to whether the FAA is still applying the same high standards to certification that they always said that they did. So that's one of the controversies. So remember when I talked to those of you in my class about whenever we look at an accident, one of the things we look at is controversies. We always want to look at judicial involvement, we want to look at political involvement, we want to look at false theories, uh, we want to look at uh, national pride being involved that tends to warp our perceptions and prevent a good quality investigation from taking place. Those are all things we need to be alert to. There's the probes on the airplane. Uh, you've got the same probes on the right side as you do the left side. These are your pedostatic instruments up above. And then kind of in the dark down here, uh, that's your angle of attack sensor. So it's the AOA sensors on the airplane that are suspect. We also had problems with sensors on the Air France flight that crashed out of the South Atlantic. I always ask myself, who's flying this airplane? If it's just a sensor that's bad, the airplane itself is still flying. Why should you lose control of an airplane because a sensor goes bad? When we are out, whether we're learning our private certificate or commercial certificate or any other certificate, and we do partial panel, part of the reason is to get you to remember to fly the airplane even when the instruments or one or two of the instruments are not giving you accurate information. The sensors may not be telling you the right thing. You should be able to do that if you're going to become a fully certificated professional pilot. So there's the AOA main. One on the other side as well, there's two of them. As part of the procedure to recover from a failed AOA or angle of attack uh, signal, Boeing says and has said, apply the runaway trend procedure. The runaway trend procedure has been pretty standard for decades, not just on this airplane, but on most airplanes. What do you do? You turn off the stand turn. There's two of the switches, one for the autopilot and one for the main electric trim. Just turn off. So before I go any further, what is the indication that makes you think you should turn them off? Well, that's when you can't control the pitch of the airplane. The pitch of the airplane is normally controlled either on the autopilot with the autopilot using the 
controlling the stabilizer, or through the thumb switch on the yoke, the electric trim. There's two, the two ways you typically control the pitch other than the elevator. The stabilizer moves on 737, and that's the pitch trim. And the elevators, which are in the aft part of the stabilizer, are controlled by the yoke. So if you are fighting the stabilizer with the elevator, you're going to lose because the stabilizer is a lot bigger. If the stabilizer is like this and you're like this and you're trying to overpower it using that little elevator, you're going to lose because there's a lot more aerodynamic force on the stabilizer. So you have to keep the airplane trim. If you let the airplane get very much out of trim, the forces on the controls are going to be very high. And they're going to get worse the more the airplane's out of trim. And they're going to get worse the faster the airplane goes because the dynamic forces keep going up. Boeing says the solution is just turn off those switches and then see those big wheels, see that big black thing there on the left and the one on the right? That's your manual pitch trim. That, that's connected to a drum that rotates a cable that goes to the back of the airplane and manually moves the stabilizer. No hydraulic pressure, no nothing. Direct control. And it's been on there since 1967. There is a little knob that's embedded on the left side on the, over here and on the right side over there that you can flip out as a pilot and you can use to give you a little more leverage to move that a little bit with a little more force. You know, anybody remembers the old days where you had Brody knobs on your, on your uh, steering wheel of the cars? It's kind of a Brody knob. Uh, you have to remember to pull this thing out and use it. If you don't, what you're doing is you're just ripping that stabilizer trim as hard as you can and you're pulling or pushing. You're pulling normally. Uh, if you're trying to keep the nose up, you're pulling back to try to get it. And you're just moving a cable. So the more you let this thing get out of trim, the more revolutions of this wheel that you're going to have to make physically. So since October, we had an operations bulletin. This came out from Boeing. Yeah, in my classes, we talk about all the different kind of documents that the FAA can put out. Some of them are optional. Some of them are mandatory. This was, did not have the strength of a regulation. It was issued by the manufacturer. It was the guidance that came out after the Lion Air accident in October, where they essentially just said in so many words, if you have an erroneous pitch trim input for any reason, including a erroneous input from the AOA and an impasse, just disconnect those two switches and trim the airplane. That was the guidance. That's all the guidance that we've had since Lion Air. So guess what? Three weeks ago, we had a bigger problem. Okay, This is now an airworthiness directive. This is from the FAA. And it is mandatory. And it is now requiring those procedures to be emphasized in every plane's flight manual. But it still doesn't say anything about physically changing the airplane or the design of the airplane. And this was issued about a week and a half ago. This is grounding order. This is from the FAA grounding all the airplanes. Emergency order of prohibition, of course, using the jargon of the government. The big challenge for the people who operate this airplane is how long is this airplane going to be grounded? And are we going to fix the real problem? And a lot depends upon the outcome of these two investigations. So, the Indonesians came out with what's called a preliminary report. Under IKO Annex 13, which governs international accident investigations, you're supposed to put out a preliminary report at 30 days. 
you do a draft final report much later. Sort of the standard is a year, but it could be much longer depending. So the preliminary report came out. This is what it looks like. There's the flight path of the airplane, how far it actually went before it descended into the ocean. Some facts that we know as a result of the first accident is that there were several mechanical discrepancies on the airplane before the airplane ever departed Jakarta. They were known to the airline. They'd had airspeed discrepancies on multiple flights. They had AOA discrepancies on multiple flights. In fact, on the last previous flight of this airplane, uh, they had had the AOA failure and the pitch problem, but the pilots on that particular airplane applied the Boeing procedure, disconnected the trim, and then resumed flight. They notified their company. The, uh, the maintenance department ran some bike tests and other kinds of standard tests, couldn't find any kind of a problem signed it off and put it back into service. Big issue there. The second issue was why the pilots of this flight did not follow the approved going procedure and turn off the electric trim switches and continue to try to fight it using the elevator. Remember I said, if you're fighting stabilizer with the elevator, you're going to lose. They lost. So those were two big questions that still need to be resolved because the final report is not out. And we saw just a second ago what Boeing did about it. They, they issued that fairly simple operations bullet, bulletin, which in so many words just said, keep on doing what you've been doing. And the FAA went along with it. Yesterday, the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, Ministry of Transport, issued a preliminary report. They were actually a week early. And you may have seen the news conference with uh, their spokesman from the Ministry of Transport. Uh, in it, they said very little. The essential guidance that they gave was, we recommend the manufacturer take steps to correct the problem. They also said, we absolve the pilots of all responsibility. There are so many words, they didn't use those words, but that's what they said. Uh, this is an ADSD uh, track off of uh, Flight Radar 24. It was established right the day after the accident. And all it does is basically show the route of flight. Uh, there's also a profile view. And uh, the one thing you picked up, and I don't have a screen of it here, but the airplane accelerated and continued to accelerate at extremely low altitude all the way to BMO. BMO is the maximum operating allowable speed of the airplane. It's about 340 indicated. We're below a thousand feet AGL. And they were going like a bit of a hill. So, mysteries, mysteries. Uh, up until this report was released yesterday, we had very little in the way of actual factual information. And there were a lot of concerns about the way the investigation was being run. Uh, I could answer questions about that, but I want to get on and finish up here so we can do a q and um, But where we stand is there's still a lot of questions in this investigation as to what extent was the design flaw the problem and to what extent were other factors. And for those of you who have taken my classes, you well know that Almost all accidents are what we call multi-causal. 
there are primary or active causes and there are secondary contributing or latent causes. And if you don't look at all of them, you will probably miss something important. If you miss it, and you don't try to correct it, it won't happen again. And we learned about previous accidents where that's happened, where we just didn't fix the problem the first time, and they go came around the second time. So I think that's where I'm going to stop. Uh, there's a lot more to be said about this. Uh, I'm sure many of you have questions. Uh, so I'll leave it up to Pete to decide how much time we have. Well, first off, we have questions from the audience. Great point to jump in and then as uh, we go through that, we we'll take the questions off the chat. Okay. Guys, what do you got? Yeah. Two very good questions. So, in the first question, exactly how does an angle attack communicator work? It's just a little blade like a wing that sticks out into the airflow. Mount, mount it on a gimbal, and it just senses the airflow as it passes from nose of the airplane. So if the airplane is pitched up, it, it shows an extreme angle, and it sends a signal into the flight control computer, and that data is in process. So it's a really fundamental, very simple instrument. Now, all their transport category airplanes have had them had it for a long time. And having a malfunction in one of these is kind of unusual. It's a simple instrument. Uh, the other question, I think a lot of you have this is how come this airplane is more than this? And uh, that's something the investigation is going to have to address. But if you ask me, and a lot of airplanes, there's one way to reduce the risk. That's full power act. Okay. You can pull the power back a lot of ways. If you've got an auto throttle on, you can push the button and call for flying power and push it back. The pilot flying can save the flying power, and the other pilot can push the button for him. You can disconnect the auto throttle that was on. So you can fire the bus lever to an appropriate value. These things are normally done after takeoff uh, during the after takeoff sequence. It took typically a thousand feet. It takes the airplane over a little bit, accelerate, pull the flaps up, pull back on power, and then resume. If you, for some reason, need to go back and land, you don't resume the flight, then you keep pulling power way back. And then you're kind of cruising on the track like that, and you find you don't need a lot of power. There's no magic that's going to do it for you guys. And the investigators in this accident are going to have to explain why these two pilots never pulled the power back and allowed it to accelerate to do it That compounded their problem in this next question. Thank you. Greg, I've heard on the news that there was a lot of discussion about the fact that the AOA was an aftermarket add on that's going and pulled that up a little bit of the aircraft and sent it in order to. Uh, the only thing I know, Roger, can you repeat the question? Yeah, Gerard said that there's some talk on, uh, I think, the internet around uh, that the AOA sensor is being used by Boeing was aftermarket. Well, they're not delivered. Oh, 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 okay. Now I know what you're talking about. Uh, the answer is the AOA sensor are part of the certification of the airplane their original equipment. Um, there's a manufacturer and a repair facility down in Florida that has been identified as having done some overhaul work. But the question you have is directed at the warning display. Now, there is an optional warning display on the max that a customer can buy for Boeing that tells you if there's a disagree 
between the left AOA sense and the right AOA sense. Okay. It's optional because you only get eighty thousand dollars for the AOA gift for that. It's also optional because some the country the companies so a lot on this it's a big waste of time. It shouldn't take means to be able to figure out the difference of that. You know, one side is showing one thing and one side is showing the other. And I shouldn't be able to figure that out. Boeing has decided they're going to give it away free, but whenever Boeing gives something away free, you, know, you still have to install. So I can just imagine this is just going to be the software gives a little comment box about that big and you're going to pay you in the tanks to put it together. So I don't know about free. It's better than nothing, and it's cool to just, just do something. I don't think in the grand scheme of things it's going to be a huge. Anybody else? So there's been some reporting about uh, what Boeing was trying to do with Airbus to get out of a very cool, efficient aircraft. And that is their answer to the, the Airbus. Okay, so it's a different the Airbus their competition is their answer to the competition is this. And Boeing wanted to get this plane out without having to do pilot retraining for the aircraft. And they wanted to get it out as quickly as they could. And so did you tell me about that at all? Or is it well, yeah, you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. That, that Can you repeat that, Roger? Uh, Pardon me? Repeat that question. Any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, the gentleman asked, uh, based upon his reports, whether Boeing uh, hurried the production of the Max airplane uh, and made an attempt to make it as inexpensive as possible in order to compete with another plane, namely the A320 Neo, its introduction on airlines. And the answer is yes. Uh, it is a competitive world out there. When you're trying to sell anything, you've got to compete with competition. If somebody's got a, a good product out there, you've got to try to eat it or eat it. Uh, the challenge becomes are you cutting too deeply in order to get the airplane into the market? Quick? And we're all going to have to figure that out. That should be something that's going to come up in the course of all these investigations. But the short answer is they definitely wanted to get the airplane. Uh, certified, and by certified, I mean the only thing they have to certify are the changes in the It's not the entire airplane. And they wanted that process to be as quick and smooth as possible. And so, one of the reasons that they didn't put the ink information in the FCOM is because they didn't want to trigger the possibility of an extra day of simulator training in extra expense for their customers. And make it, put them at a disadvantage of selling the <clears throat> That is a very common practice throughout the industry. And Roger, it's my understanding that the, the simulator issue is also a question. A lot of the foreign carriers don't have simulators. So that's a huge business impact. Is, would that not, is that not correct? That's one of many considerations. That's right. If you're a small carrier, you may have to get contract simulator training right. in Toronto or Phoenix or somewhere else, and you have to pay your Pilots to go there and fly the box, and it's expensive. Yeah. So we have several questions from online. Okay. The first and probably simplest is do you think that the 737 MAX series should be a different type rate? I think it's moot. I think a lot of people are going to say that the 737 has reached the end of the line and probably. We're not going to see any more versions of this airplane, uh, kind of along the logic of enough is enough. And I suspect you're going to hear politicians talking about that. So my opinion, my opinion is somewhere along the line, we probably should have said, Boeing, build another airplane and certify it properly. I, th that's the best answer I can give. Okay. Next question is, when it comes to the AOA indicator system, Disagreeing indication. Is there information about whether the sensor is failure prone or is the airline maintenance being done incorrectly? Excellent question. And the answer is I don't know. That's going to be a matter of very a careful evaluation of a very large amount of data to try to determine, you know, whether the engineering was bad or whether the maintenance 
conscience was bad. And usually what happens, it's a little bit of both. Next one's an easy one, which is, um, I mean, so I recently had coffee with a Mac pilot and she told me there was no mention of the MCAT system in the operator's manual from our airline. Would the decision to leave it out of the manual come from the airline or directly from Boeing? Boeing. And then the last one is, what's the difference between flight envelope protection on 787, 777, and Airbus in the new MCAT system? And are there similarities to quantum flight 72 where repeated nose down to the country? Uh, several questions there. They're all good questions. Uh, the difference between MCAS on a very old Jurassic jet like this one and a modern Airbus or 777 or 787 is those airplanes were designed from scratch from the beginning to be fly by wire airplanes with flight protections built in. They're comprehensive flight protections, not just pitch protection, but uh, bank. Uh, Many other elements of flight to keep you within the envelope when you're in the law. Uh, and this airplane is what we have an add on type of device that's attempting to, to pre pre preserve its pitch integrity in one dimension, but it's just an add on. We, had, we have one other question. Yeah. And if you can repeat that before you answer that, please. Yeah, I'll make sure I get this correct. Why do other countries not train their pilots to disconnect? No, disengage. Like we're taught and manually fly the plane. Disengage. Just engage all automation to fly the plane. Is that the question? Yeah. Like, why are they not taught that if they can fly I think there's an easier way to, to ask the question, which is why don't other countries train through our standards? Basically, yes, okay. Well, I, I think there's two questions here. Let me try to answer both. Uh, I think there's a huge challenge for many startup airlines and many foreign carriers to try to meet the same standards that we have. Sometimes we underestimate the number of decades that we have of, of experience operating technologically compared to what somebody may have. In, some other country. And, and so when we present them with this really complex device and say, here it is, we'll fly it, read the book, uh, we're expecting to fall a lot. Second, uh, every country has their own regulatory apparatus. Okay, they're a sovereign country, they have their own government, uh, and they are obligated to regulate their airlines. Some do, some don't. Some have practically no effective oversight. In many cases, you just have a bureaucrat who goes see if he can see an airplane. He's supposedly exercising oversight. So the airline really does what they want to do. So that's part of the answer. Yeah. So that kind of is that the Best way to kind of close out this conversation. Uh, uh, I, I sometimes use a little metaphor when we talk about manufacturers. Think of it as a family. The father wants to make money, the mother wants to raise a well mannered, successful little plane. Uh, the FAA is sort of the, the priest and the rule giver, and, and the NTSB is the nagging mother. <laughs> Nobody likes the mother in the space. Um, Sometimes we have to tell people stuff they don't want to hear. So come back to really the fundamental question, which is, is he FAA comfortable in answer to uh, Because of my experience in government, I have a lot of friends in the FAA, I know people in the certification service. Uh, there's a group called the Effective Evaluation Group. I know that. And for their, he retired, but he teaches a kind of like I do in place. And uh, he's very candid. In recent years, the pressure on the FAA 
reduce certification costs, reduce complexity of regulations that have been enormous. It comes from the Congress, it comes from political commentators, uh, it comes from everywhere. And the FAA is the recipient huge criticism. They get budget fights every year where they, their budget is cut. And the, uh, many of the airlines and the operators out there, they want to cut that regulation too. And it has been cut a lot. A lot of this has been delegated to the individual manufacturers or designated representatives who are supposed to act on behalf of the FAA. And uh, that system definitely broke out. The FAA, the AG group, people I know, they're going past them. They're going to be a lot to pay for. That's okay. Roger, that's awesome. Great. Uh, I know we <laughs> I know we could uh, learn a lot from Roger every brief thing you do. I think that might be a bit much to ask for him, but I know I'm going to be asking you to come back again. So uh, thanks for giving us this brief on something that's very much in the news and something that we as professional aviators and uh, incipient professional aviators are definitely going to want to uh, be tracking. Aaron and I were talking offline a little bit in response to the question about why are the other airlines not just using sort of the American method of certification. One other thing to think about, which is a big culture issue, is that the United States has a unique uh, naval, has a, a unique general aviation uh, culture. Um, people come here to learn how to fly, and we have more people who understand flying little airplanes, I think, than most other, almost every country do. And I see heads nodding over on Roger's side. Um, so, uh, in fact, I just mentioned yesterday one of my classes that we were watching a YouTube video on instructors teaching helicopter pilots how to do auto rotations. And so many of these instructors have British accents because folks come from all over the world to fly in the United States because it's cheaper and we actually have the most robust, robust uh, general aviation culture. So, that's part of your answer to that question. And also, something we should be thankful for, and also something we need to maintain. So remember our responsibility to not uh, basically not screw up in public and, and endanger that. So, so thanks again, Roger. Uh, one, one more thought, please. Yesterday, the Canadians came out and said they wanted to certify all airplanes now, including those manufactured in the United States. EASA, which is the European Aviation Agency, has been saying that for quite some time. Of course, the Chinese would love to be able to do that and get us off their backs. Uh, so. This has been an opening, giving Boeing a big black eye and the FAA a big black eye as an opening for everybody else in the world to jump into the certification business. And it's a big deal. Well, thanks, Roger. So uh, we're running a little bit behind, and I know that was absolutely worth it to be running a little bit behind. But we're switching slides here and uh, take a note that, as usual, we're going to switch to um, watching our AOPA video. And I'm going to put that online here. But to avoid sound problems and stuff like that, what I, as soon as I get a hand free, I'm going to post in the chat the link to the YouTube video. And although the slide says be back at 12.10, um, I'll change that. We need to be back about 12.20, because uh, we ran a little long on this one. So uh, those of you online, we're about to freeze the video, and I will put in the link for going to the AOPA video. So be back here at the 12.20 GPS time. And we'll, we'll go into a discussion of what the video is about, and then we'll talk to Ian Selby about the rotary wing stuff that he's going to give us as well. So uh, uh, on, on a count of three here, Aaron, if you could freeze the tape, and then uh, I will post that link here in a second. So three, two, one, back.